Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 535th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Wow, don't we live in interesting times. I have said for years that the most important thing that we can be doing right now is figuring out how to grow our own food. At Urban Farm U, our goal has been to share knowledge about self-reliance and connecting to our local food systems. Now, these skills are more important than ever. When this all went down a couple of weeks ago, our team got together and asked the question, what can we do? So we decided to start offering daily, live, online gardening and sustainability related classes to provide a positive, fun and supportive environment to learn tools that will boost morale and empower you to feel more grounded and secure. We offer them each day, Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific. Don't worry if you can't make the class live. You can listen to the recordings as we will send you emails with daily class links. Join us at IWantToGarden.com and let's get out and garden together. Today on our podcast, we have someone who has solutions for controlling unwanted volunteers in our farms and gardens. We're talking with returning guest John Moody about weed suppression. John does not consider himself a typical farmer. Farming and homesteading were not something he ever planned to do. Growing up, he enjoyed a varied diet of video games, cartoons, and processed food. Dental decay, seasonal allergies, and constant sickness were the inevitable result, one that doctors denied was connected to food and lifestyle choices. In his early 20s, he was waylaid by a duodenal ulcer, his body's warning that some things were dreadfully awry. Over the course of a year, he and his now wife, Jessica, completely changed their understanding of food, asking, what is food? How should it be raised and how should it be prepared? This eventually led to moving out to the farm of their own and writing several books, including The Frugal Homesteader Handbook, The Elderberry Book, and Winning the War on Weeds. John, we got to meet you in podcast episode 116 in our early podcasting days. Welcome back to the show. Are you ready to rock weeds? I am. Thank you so much for having me back. Absolutely. And excellent. So can you bring us up to speed on what's been happening with you since we chatted last? So that was four years ago. Um, So at that time, we had four kids. Now we have five kids. Congratulations. At that time, I don't think I'd written any books, you know, really in like the homesteader farmer field. And I think I have, I'll have five by the end of this year finished. Congratulations on that. Yeah, that's, that's been a hoot to make up for lost time. (laughs) I I realized like having kids and writing books are kind of mutually exclusive endeavors. Oh yes. So it's been nice to get caught up on the writing side now that we're hopefully done on the having kids side of things. Right. Where in the world do you live? We're in Kentucky still. So we're still at the same property we've been at since I guess it was around 2010, 2011 that we purchased, purchased this land. Nice. And tell me about the land. Our land is pretty typical for Kentucky. It's slightly hilly. When we purchased it, it was terribly over farmed and over grazed. Mm. So we had less than 0.5% organic matter. Oh my gosh. Really? That's like desert soil. Oh, oh it, it's, you know, I always joke when I give my soil talk that I broke the tiller before I broke the soil. <laughs> Because our soils, you know, I can send you a few pictures to put in the notes. Our our soil is like a moonscape. Oh, wow. But now in our main growing areas, we're running 20 to 25% organic matter. Nice. So it makes quite a substantial difference to successfully growing stuff. How much land do you have? We have 35 total acres. Wow. 35 acres. How cool is that? What are you doing with it all? Mostly we, we have about one and a half acres we use for perennial and annual vegetable and fruit production. Mm -hmm. And then the remaining land we use for pasturing and rotating pigs through. And if we, if we decide to refence the farm, which is probably not something we're going to do because we're actually looking at moving in the coming year, we would go back to also raising cattle. So 
So for the moment, we're mostly kind of winding things down on this property, getting everything good and tidy and ready for us to hopefully relocate. Oh, wow. What's what's the intent for me relocating? Are you going to downsize? Are you going to upsize? I don't know if we'll either downsize or upsize. It really depends on what we can find mm-hmm. uh, land-wise. And there's there's a host of interrelated reasons we want to relocate. When we purchased this farm, we were only a family of 4.5. Mm-hmm. And now we're a family of seven. And if you're a family of five, this house and this farm would be perfect. But for a family of seven, it just doesn't quite work. Right. Got <laughs> um, it. Yeah. And for our elderberry business, it would be it'd be really great. We'd really like to have a certified kitchen on our property. Mm-hmm. And where we live, that's just not viable cost wise. Got it. And I really, you know, one of the reasons we want the certified kitchen on property is our kids are, you know, part of their schooling is working in the farm, family, homestead business stuff. Um, wow. And so as soon as you move, it, 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 like this is what I'm talking about in other talks, but for most of human history, where you lived and where you work weren't like completely sundered from one another and sundered from your family. Mm-hmm. And so we want to have that for our family, that where we live and where we work, it, you know, both production and consumption happen in the same place. Yeah, that's interesting. That's what I do here at the Urban Farm. My office is on site. My gardens are on site. Most everything I do is here here where I live. So I understand that. Yeah. And then if you have kids, they can actually be a part of any and all aspects of that mm-hmm. rather than, you know, you as an adult having your life and world and they as a kid having their life and world and you intersect a few hours a day at best. Yeah. Wow. So I I, I do want to get to the weeds, but something in your bio really kind of hit my interest. When I was younger and and I'm older than you are, but in the seventies, I used to have all of these stomach problems so much. So they had me in the hospital, they were doing, you know, all kinds of tests on me. They couldn't figure out what the heck was wrong with me. They never bothered to ask me what I was eating. And back in the 70s and early 80s, I literally, I would eat at Wendy's up to 10 times a week. You know, that means I was eating there sometimes twice a day and I'd eat a, you know, a burger and fries and an iced tea. And the doctors never bothered asking me what I was eating. And it turns out in 1991, I stopped eating red meat altogether for a myriad of reasons, and my stomach problems magically disappeared. It sounds to me like you have a similar story. Yeah. I mean, I grew up eating, you know, basically a standard American diet, Mm -hmm. lots of refined carbohydrates, processed vegetable oils, you know, low quality industrial meats and whatnot. And it eventually, you know... I had enough antibiotics as a child to qualify as my own CAFO animal operation. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, it's just, you know, just ridiculous. And yeah, we we went through a process when I developed the ulcers and stuff. We just completely rebuilt everything we thought and knew about food. Mm-hmm. So, so, so it, it was quite the journey. You know, like I always joke that we went all the way down the rabbit hole because we were like, you know, the people shopping at Walmart and Sam's Club um, to the people who now home birthed five children, you know, (laughs) Uh, you know, just about as far as far as I could get from where I started to where I am. It should hopefully give hope for any listeners because we just got there one week, one change at a time. Right. So it's really crazy to think about how I used to eat and live and then kind of look at, you know, how I eat and live now. (laughs) Right. Exactly. So let's jump over into weeds. And what exactly are you talking about is a weed? Well, you know, a weed generally is an unwanted plant, you know, and it's unwanted because of, you know, not just because of what species it is, but maybe also because of what place it is. And so, you know, and and I don't, you you know, weeds are not a pejorative to me in the sense of we eat quite a fair bit of weeds and there is a large number that we also use medicinally. Mm -hmm. And so, but we just want them to grow and occur in ways and places that are beneficial rather than bothersome. 
And how do you go about distinguishing that? It, it really, you know, you have to get to know the plants in your ecosystem and kind of their habits. And, you know, can, can you peacefully coexist with them and certain other plants? Or do you need to relocate them to other places? You know, and if you need to relocate them or rid yourself of them, how do you do that in the most beneficial and least disruptive way possible? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like two plants we have, well, really three plants we have on our, our farm that were really bothersome until recently. One is, I think it's Canadian thistle, mm. really, you know, really irksome plant, quite unpleasant to encounter, ungloved. Then we have pigweed, which is in the amaranth family. And that plant is also just very, very unpleasant to deal with. And then we have prickly cucumber. And, and you know, so these are three plants. They, they're not, oh, you know, they're not really edible. They're not really that medicinal. And they choke out our otherwise beneficial plants. You know, so those would be plants that we would identify for complete and utter removal from, you know, annual growing spaces. Mm -hmm. But then you have it's like lamb's quarter, you know, lamb's quarter and chickweed and some of those type, and, you know, plantain and some of those types of plants. And those are ones that we try and partner with instead of, you know, have to completely remove. And when we're working with those kind of plants, it's, it's all about where are they occurring? When do they go to seed? How do they reproduce? How do we manage them beneficially? you know, rather than seek to completely eradicate them. So there, there's a lot of plant by plant considerations. And then as you know, there's also crop by crop considerations. Oh yeah. You know, cause some crops like carrots really just are only going to do well in a very, very weed free environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas some other plants are going to actually do better with some kind of understory. You know, so like with our peppers and some of our other taller plants, I don't want to grow them without a certain amount of ground level competition underneath. But in those cases, I usually want to choose what's growing underneath rather than let it just be willy nilly. Right. And that so for here, us here in the desert, having that understory of weeds, because we have a couple of them that kind of grow along the ground underneath that actually shades the ground and keeps it cooler in the summertime. Exactly. You know, this is um, well. We had some people out to our farm a few years ago because it's it's really common in Kentucky. You see people who have gardens, and in between the plants is a moonscape. It's like dead, dying, drying, cracking, crumbling earth that is baking in the July. You know, sixteen hours of sun, mm -hmm. hundred degree heat. And when we have people out on the farm, I will you know take a thermometer. And we'll usually have a couple spots that are a bit more barren and then a couple spots that, you know, are under or cover cropped with a main crop and we'll stick the thermometer in the ground. And we'll also have people touch so they can see and, and, and you know, then then we'll talk with them about, you know, what do you think this 120 degree temperature is doing to the moisture in the ground and the roots in the ground and the, the soil food web that lives in this ground? versus, you know, the area that is cover cropped or whatnot that is only 80 degrees or 75 degrees or 65 degrees even. Mm -hmm. So really you're talking about many of the things are about talking about partnering with the weeds. Yeah. yeah well, partnering with them or understanding, you know, how to remove residual plants in a way that benefits your soil rather than damages it. Mm -hmm. So, so again, there's a lot of, you know, there's a, so many different techniques for weed control. And I really wanted to explore for farmsteaders and small scale, for homesteaders and small scale farmers, basically all of the major non-chemical and non-tillage based approaches. So what are they? Oh man. You know, the, fir the first one I talk about is just like designing your growing spaces to minimize weed problems. Ooh, how do you do that? Well, you know, it's one of the things that drove this home to me is when I drive back and forth from town once or twice a week, you know, a lot of people have gardens and you'll see them mowing, you know, mowing and throwing grass into their gardens when they mow mm. or just, you know, so it's doing things like developing windbreaks 
or transition spaces from pasture or grass to your garden to minimize, you know, the infiltration of grasses and other unwanted or unfitting plants, you you know, for that space and purpose. Or, you know, fences. Fences are such an issue with a garden because fences usually become completely overgrown and infiltrated by weeds and other plants. And then they, you know, continue to spread and work their way in. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so I have one whole chapter that just talks about, you know, different design considerations, different strategies, you know, like using wind breaks, Uh, you know, so like in our garden, you know, the wind where we live is primarily from west blowing east. And so on that west side of the garden, I have elderberries planted as a windbreak. I'm going to be putting in some mint in an area, both to kind of deal with some excess water and as like a further capture. Then I have a double row of comfrey, and then we had blackberries until recently, which I think I'm going to swap out for raspberries. And so we had this tiered transition from, you know, basically lawn pasture to deeply mulched perennials. And then finally, you get into annual growing space. Mm -hmm. And, And that transition means a lot of it, it just keeps a lot of stuff from getting into the annuals, which you know generally need more care and less competition. Right. So basically, the, what you're doing is you're putting up a a weed seed barrier between your pastures and your gardens. Yes, exactly. Whereas a lot of people just let the grass go, grow right up to the edge of their garden, and then they wonder why they have you know so much stuff. <laughs> right. Wow. All right. Cool. So that's one way of managing weeds. Another way? So I broke it up in the book is, you know, like there's there's kind of defensive measures against weeds and then there's aggressive measures against weeds. Mm-hmm. So t- defensive measures are like cover cropping, you, you know, so basically instead of letting nature choose what grows alongside your plants, be intentional and selective and you decide what's going to grow along with your plants, mm-hmm. you know, so cover cropping and companion planting and, and you know, cause those are such great strategies for both improving your soil or improving, you know, productivity of a space, you know, at the same time. And, and really, you know, like, you know, like last year in our high tunnel, I did some experiments where I grew rows of cucumbers and then right kind of tightly nestled underneath the cucumbers, I grew basil. And then underneath the basil, I grew bush beans. Oh, wow. You you know, so so these very, very tight intercrop patterns Mm -hmm. that made it so like there's very, very little weeding to do because there's just not a lot of light, you know, getting to the soil, which encourages germination and whatnot. And a lot of resources are tied up and a lot of chemicals are being reduced put out by those plants that help suppress germination. But then you're, you know, you're getting a lot of root matter in the soil The beans are fixing nitrogen for subsequent plants, you know, and you're, you're getting a high value crop in between a mid value and a lower value crop, but all in a very, very low space, Mm -hmm. you know, or out in the field, I really, really love, you know, companion planting with clovers. Oh, yes. Because then again, you're getting, you you know, I love talking about growing your own fertilizer because one of the biggest problems I run into when I do consulting with people, a lot of people, they basically tend to use a lot more nitrogen. Mm -hmm. They use phosphorus and potassium in their growing spaces. So a lot of growers over time end up, you, you know, but the main way a lot of people want to get nitrogen into their growing spaces is from animal manures. Right. And, and and this is a math equation that does not pencil out over time because you end up with elevated, you know, of the NPK equation, you end up with elevated P and K and a deficiency of N and, and your fertilizer only makes that worse. Whereas it's really, really important, not just in terms of, you know, weed strategy, but in terms of, regenerative management of a growing space to take advantage of nitrogen fixing plant species, both the ones that are edible or food producing or the ones that just can serve as cover crops or other roles 
to keep, to keep your soil in balance and not create these kind of nutrient imbalances that become difficult to fix. So basically you're talking about creating your own nitrogen fertilizer by planting nitrogen fixing plants. Yeah. And using them to suppress weeds at the same time. Oh, nice, man. That is permaculture in action. Yeah. Well, well, and you know, it's just, it's also just like, I have five kids. Life is already busy and difficult. <laughs> right. I don't want to create other problems for myself. Yeah. So whenever nature offers solutions, I'm always a big fan. <laughs> yeah. When one of the, one of the ways to manage weeds also, and I, and I do this and I was doing this in my front yard yesterday because lamb quarters grows wild in my yard. Yep. And I like to say that Weeds are pioneer species. They show up early. They do the heavy digging for us. They're, uh, I've seen some reports recently that say that weeds are much more nutrient dense than a lot of the groceries we're buying. And so one of the things that I do is I manage the seed production on them. So when yep. they start going to seed, I just break off the to- seed tops and get rid of those. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, I talk about in the book, like with lamb's quarter in our area, it will not go to seed generally until, you know, sometime in September. Mm-hmm. So we'll manage it just by scything it back, you know, keeping it cut back or whatever uh, until it actually becomes a risk of going to seed on us. And then at that point, we'll do something more permanent to get rid of it. If for some reason it's still persistent and a danger of going to seed, you know, while there's other species of plants, especially grasses in Kentucky, that we never, ever give any opportunity to go to seed. Because as Elliot Coleman put it so eloquently, you know, one year of seed is seven years of weed. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, knowing your plant species makes a big difference to knowing how you prioritize what to do about what. Because there's some plant species you just, you know, you, you can give them no square inch or they will become the ruler of your garden. Right, exactly. Yeah, so we, I talk about eating weeds in the book. And you're right, I give some info in the book on just how much nutritional value some of these plants have compared to ones you might plant. Because I think lamb's quarter is something like three to six times more nutritious than spinach. Oh, wow. And like in Kentucky, spinach is very finicky to grow. Mm-hmm. And if you point out like lamb's quarter just grows like wild. Right. You know, so another line I heard recently, I think Joel Salatin shared it, but it's by, um, I think Darren Doherty is he goes, we need to stop. Gro-, he, he goes, we need to stop planting and trying to grow things that want to die. Mm-hmm. And we need to stop killing things that want to live. Wow. Right. <laughs> in, in, in terms of like an agricultural methodology. Mm -hmm. So so we've really, over the years, there's a lot of things we don't try and grow anymore because if it wants to die, then why are we trying to grow it? Why don't we find plants that really want to live where we live and grow where we are? Yep. So other strategies I talk about, I go over solarization and oculation Mm -hmm. since those are two techniques that have became more and more popular. And I want people to understand kind of what they do, what they don't do, and how best to use those two techniques, since they really can be quite effective. That's more aggressive. Yeah, and that's on the aggressive side, uh, more aggressive weed removal techniques in terms of knocking back the soil seed bank and you know, re- really reducing the number of viable plants you're going to have to deal with in an area. Cool. And how effective is mulching? Uh, the effectiveness is mulching. All depends on the mulch you're using, Mm -hmm. the timing of its application, and the type of weeds that you're trying to suppress. So, and and this is why mulching has such mixed reviews because there's, you know, some species, I think one of them is like crabgrass that some people have that just like grows laterally. You know, some weed species, mulching can actually make Make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so so we use mulching very heavily. My personal preference is for aged wood chip mulches. Mm -hmm. I think all the research shows that they are just by and far the best mulch, but they're also incompatible with a number of crops and crop planting techniques. You know, so one thing I explore in the book is it's 
it, your your choice of weed control is informed and constrained by the choice of plants you want to grow and how you're getting those plants in and out of the ground. So you, you know the, the the example is like you can't wood chip mulch beds that you're going to plant carrots into generally, and you can't use something like a paper pot transplanter into a wood chip mulch. You know, and so the tools you're going to use in your garden and the plants you're going to grow are going to require you to have a flexible approach to what weed method, you know, weed control methods you use. Mm -hmm. I often tell people that gardening is one great big grand experiment and I can share with you what has worked for me, which will give you a leg up on figuring out what might work for you, but then you have to go figure it out. Oh, exactly. You know, because, you know, I have people only a few miles from us and we cannot grow um, squashes because of squash vine borer. Mm -hmm. And they're only a few miles away and have no issue at all. Yeah. You you know, so it's absolutely true. Take take all gardening advice with a grain of salt. (laughs) Right. And then go experiment and figure out what works for you. So. I'm going to assume that you're not going to use any chemicals. No, we we don't use, well, you know, we've tried horticultural vinegar Mm -hmm. just because I wanted, you know, if you're going to write about a book about things, then you should have experience what you're writing about. And and so we've tried a few, um, we've also tried some of the homemade weed control sprays that are Mm -hmm. like vinegar. Dr. Bronner's soap, Epsom salts, and whatnot. So we've tried some of those non-persistent, organic-approved type chemicals. And I discuss those in the book, but I, I generally don't find them overly effective for the cost and time investment. You know, they, they work really well, like if you're maintaining cracks in a concrete patio or, you know, a brick path or something. Right. But but in your growing spaces, I've been pretty unimpressed. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. So by those, you know, especially again, compared to like well-timed oculation, well-timed solarization, well-deployed, you know, bio mulches, you know, cover cropping and other things. Do me a favor. You've used that word twice now, oculation. It's a word that some of our listeners might not be familiar with, and quite honestly, nor am I. Tell us what that is. Yeah. So it, if you're listening and you guess that it's related to the word occult, which means dark, you're a winner. Ah. So oculation is basically when you cover the ground with a dark, you know, generally black tarp of some kind. Mm. And you usually do this. One of the reasons a lot of growers like oculation is you generally do it off growing season right. for, for those who actually have an off growing season, you know? So like here in Kentucky, I would be oculating January, February, March outdoors, you know, into April. And what happens is, you know, you do whatever prep you need to do to the ground and you install your tarp over the ground and the tarp traps moisture, but it also warms the ground. And that causes, you know, seeds to germinate. Mm -hmm. But when they germinate, they subsequently suffocate and die because there is no light. There is no air. So it's a, and and the other nice thing with oculation is it warms the soil for you, so you can get a couple week up to a month bump in terms of how early you can transplant. Oh right. So, so it's a really you know it, it's a technique that works with the soil rather than against the soil. All you're doing is tricking plants into germinating at a time when they'll have no hope of actually <laughs> making. Re- yeah. So this is the op- kind of the opposite of solarizing then, because we solarize our soil here sometimes in the desert, but we do that in the summertime and basically we're cooking the weeds. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So solarization, you know, and people sometimes use the words wrongly, but in solarization, you're using clear, usually greenhouse grade plastic to uh, to allow and capture as much incoming solar energy as possible to raise the temperature of the soil temporarily, which one will sterilize um, any seeds in the top few inches of soil, rendering them unviable. But solarization also has some benefits if you're dealing with certain disease problems in your soil. Oh, yes. So, And then I know in California, uh, a few large-scale organic 
growers of different crops are using a technique called biosolarization, where you you know you will incorporate a tremendous amount of biomass into the soil first, and then you will solarize it. So you basically get composting action plus solarization, and you can eliminate you know all sorts of problematic species of nematodes and a number of soil-borne pathogens and diseases this way, while really restoring and improving an area of soil at the same time. Wow, that's a cool idea. It's really neat because, you know, they're doing it with, you know, like some of the waste streams they're using to do this are, you know, like the, the shell nut industry in California is a huge industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, so tens of millions of pounds of nuts. Well, what happens to all of those shells? They're reincorporating them into the soil through biosolarization. And the heat would help it break down more quickly. Exactly. So you're, you're you know, it, putting a ton of organic matter into the soil improving the soil's aeration and water retention. You know, so obviously biosolarization isn't a technique that you do all the time, but it's a technique to consider if you have some marginal or poor land that you're wanting to put an orchard into Mm -hmm. or, or something similar. It's a really neat technique to consider if, if you have to improve your soil anyway, and you also need to remove, you know, you need to transition from pasture to orchard or something. Wow. And who would have ever thought in a weed book, we'd be talking about biosolarization? Well, I, I tried to cover them all. <laughs> nice. Nice. So tell us a little bit more about your book and what it's called and where we might be able to find it. Yeah, it's called Winning the War on Weeds. And you can get it at my website, which is johnwmoody.com. Perfect. And you recently did something that's really cool that I'm hoping maybe I can attend this next year, and that's called your Rogue Food Conference. Tell us about it. Oh, goodness. So about three or four years ago, I was at a Mother Earth News Fair, and Joel Salatin and I were having lunch together. And Joel looked at me and he said, I have an idea for a conference. And and this is basically the conference Joel has always wanted to go to. Oh, nice. Yeah. And he's always been waiting for someone to put on a conference like this. And then he realized no one was going to ever do this. Mm -hmm. So he convinced me to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Uh, And basically, he wanted a conference that was all about circumvention rather than compliance with the out-of-control food and farming regulation in America. And, And so that's what the Rogue Food Conference is. It is all these people who have innovated around the roadblocks to doing local sustainable food and farming. Oh my gosh, really? Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, like, so there, one of the ladies who spoke, she started a food church, you know, so I think it was like 15 or so years ago, Sally, uh, Fallon, uh, Sally Fallon said, there may come a time where we need to start churches to protect our ability to access good food. And so Nitti, she started a 501c3 food church to use the protections afforded freedom of religion Mm -hmm. and the protections afforded a not-for-profit to be able to make food and nutritional advice accessible that otherwise in it. Like, you know, wrap your head around this. In the state of Tennessee, and I think also in states like North Carolina, you can go to jail or be heavily fined for giving nutrition advice if you are not a registered dietitian, which is an organization that receives its funding from Coca-Cola and Kraft Mm -hmm. and Kellogg. Mm -hmm. So so like I have a bunch of friends who have nutritional training from organizations like Nutritional Therapy Associates and and other, you know, basically not corporate owned nutritional education. And in a lot of these states, you cannot give nutritional advice wow. in a supposedly free country because unless you are giving corporate approved nutritional advice, the corporations have gotten the government to say you can't give nutritional advice at all. Yeah. You know, so so Nitty is doing this food church thing to get to kind of circumvent in her state. So Camus Davis, she wanted to do local meat. I believe she's in Washington or Oregon. Instead of trying to build a multi-million dollar butchering plant, she founded the Portland Meat Cooperative, which is just a totally unique organization that because they're doing education and whatnot, can do butchery and charcuterie and all of these other awesome things. Wow. 
So, so that that's what the conference was all about. The recordings from this first one will be available next week, finally. So, so people will be able to get copies and buy a copy of the event if you weren't able to attend. And we're finally settling up details for next year's event because you know, because like, you know, think about being a chef. I've came across a number of awesome people who are chefing without restaurants. Oh yes, I've seen you that. Know, yeah, you know, so they're doing pop-ups or they're doing people's houses or they're doing it at farms. And it's just great because they can make a living and they can pay farmers fairly without having to triple the prices. Because mm-hmm, they have a space. It, well, uh, Yeah, and, and to just to keep up with all of the endless inane regulations. Yeah. One thing I meant to say at the conference that I thought about all that weekend is, you know, I test my well water a number of times a year. But if I make a chicken pot pie in my home kitchen and try and sell it to you, I can go to prison. Wow. But if I was in Flint, Michigan, <laughs> or one of a hundred other cities in America that have verifiable unsafe tap water, as long as I was making that chicken pot pie in one of those certified kitchens, I could sell it to you. Wow. Like the 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 regulatory system gives a false sense of security Mm -hmm. and and it does not necessarily make the foods you are eating safer. (laughs) Right. So, so the event was just all about, you know, innovative ways to to farm and do food and stuff. Yeah. Wow. So uh, where do we find out, first of all, where to get the recordings? Secondly, about 2021's version of this? Yeah. Well, yeah. It'll all be at roguefoodconference.com. Perfect. And when do you expect the next conference to be? We're looking at March 13th for 2021. Wow, cool. It's not during the height of elderberry season. Right. Like it was here. <laughs> well, talking about elderberries, the reason I wanted to have you on the show this time was to come and share with us about elderberries. And so we're going to have you back to do a show all about elderberries. Oh, and, and that's going to be, I just love talking about elderberries it's because, you know, what topic can you cover everything from vampires to hair dye? <laughs> wow. Good question. I don't know. Stay tuned because yeah. we're going to cover it next time we talk to John. So I'd like to shift on you. And as a returning guest, do you have a childhood memory or associated with food? Yeah, I, I prepared to a positive one and a negative one. Okay. So as a kid, I grew up in a city called Youngstown, Ohio. And Youngstown had, and I believe still has to some extent, though not as much, just a very, very strong ethnic food culture. Mm -hmm. So when I married my wife, my sister would talk about these foods like wedding soup and all of the, and cookie tables for Christmas cookies and, and, you know, pit cells. And my wife had never heard of any of these foods or things. But as a kid growing up, every holiday was just marked by this celebration of traditional foods, you know, tied to one's history and family. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I just always think about the cookie table, not in terms of its healthfulness, but in terms of the the, the traditions and things it points to. So, So that's a positive food memory. And then my negative food memory when I was probably about like eight or nine years old, maybe a little older, but somewhere in that ballpark, I remember having saved up to purchase the newly released Hershey's mint chocolate bars. So this is like when Hershey came out with a mint version of their chocolate bar. Mm-hmm. And I walked up the road to our local grocery store and I bought one of these mint chocolate bars and I ate it. And that night I got one of the worst stomach bugs Mm. I have ever had in my entire life. And to this day, I can't even look at a Hershey bar without that sensation of just like feeling deathly ill. The reason I asked this question to returning guests is because these these are things that happened decades ago and they stay with us. Yeah. food, Food leaves, you know, food is more than just calories and, you know, nutrients. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Mine is, mine is, I used to go hang out in Vancouver, Canada from Phoenix uh, with my grandfather in his beehives. It was, uh, it left a lasting impression. So you'd go, why would you have to go to Canada for 
was he from Canada? Yeah, my grand my grandparents lived in British Columbia when I was uh, younger, and so we'd go up there once a summer and visit. And they had a forty acre farm, and that that as far as I can tell, that's kind of what planted the seeds for me doing what I'm doing today. Man, that must have been amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So especially to go from like you know southern United States to Canada yeah. in the summer. Yeah, it was it was epic. That is for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, John. Oh, thank you so much again for having me. I can't wait to come back and we will have a fascinating time talking all about elderberries. Elderberries. And you know what? Before the conference next in 2021, we should have you back talking about the Rogue Food Conference as well. So that And we'll do it in plenty of time so that people can get tickets if they want. Okay, great. Thank you so cool. much. Absolutely. You know what? My whole goal is to inspire people to change our food system because it is so broken. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and that's, you know, what, it, and, you know, for the listeners, you can do that by growing some herbs on your windowsill, by shopping at a farmer's market instead of a grocery store chain. There, there are actions big and small all of us can take to make a difference. Awesome. And that was the question I didn't ask, and that was for the new piece of advice. So thank you so much for that. That was awesome. And how can our listeners get a hold of you? Again, my website's johnwmoody.com. I'm also on Facebook, and our elderberry business um, is on Instagram and on Facebook, Abby's Elderberry. Nice, nice. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash John W. Moody. And if you want to hear more from John, you can find our episode 116 of the podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash J. Moody. Hey, if you've enjoyed this podcast and are interested in listening to my first podcast series, Freshly Green from 2007, you can subscribe to support the Urban Farm podcast. With that, you will have access to Freshly Green and so much more bonus content. Visit urbanfarmpodcast.org to find out more and to pledge your support. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.